Meeting today. Uh, I, I shall be starting a new topic, completely new topic, and the title of the topic is leverage and firm valuation. Leverage and firm valuation. Uh, before I go further, I would like to discuss with you that the word leverage. I hope you have heard about it. Leverage. Uh, leverage has different uh, expressions in finance. Uh, but what I would like to discuss with you in this context is that leverage here is a symbol or a, or it underlines the capital structure. Capital structure, if you remember, is the, is the financing side of the company, where money comes from. The money comes from two major sources to a, to a corporate and that is debt and equity. This proportion of debt to equity is called as a leverage ratio. So to put it simply, um, if somebody asks you, what is leverage? Well, leverage is the proportion of debt in the total finance of the company, okay? And what is leverage ratio? Well, leverage ratio is the ratio between debt to equity. So imagine there's a company, uh, let's say it's worth 100 euros. The value is 100 euros. Uh, it is financed by 60 euros as equity. And debt is 40 euros. Okay, then I can say uh, that leverage ratio is debt divided by equity, which is 0 0.67. Mm -hmm. So in simple words, uh, in, in the empirical research, when we do thesis or something, and if we have to account for leverage, uh, then often we find D to E ratio, debt to equity ratio. And 0 0.67 means for every one euro of own money, which is equity, 67 cents have been borrowed. Okay, so that's the leverage. The question is that, does leverage have an impact on the company's value or not? Yeah. That we shall study. Uh, many people say that, um, well, we, we will go further uh, on discussion, but several scholars, uh, the classical scholars in finance, they would say that, hey, debt has, the, the financing has nothing to do with the company's value. They believed in the old school of thought that the value is changed by the assets. Assets means how you invest in machinery, in plant, in equipment. So they were thinking that it's the assets of the company who bring value, but modern uh, scholars, they, they have very strong consensus about it. That no, that's not true. Uh, you can change the company's value uh, by the leverage side, uh, by, by the liabilities as well, by debt as well, because debt is a liability by the way. So that we shall study in this. But we still need to do some warm up. Uh, I hope you understand that we, we, we use, we find the beta. Do you know beta? We have done a lot of beta in the last topic. And beta is essentially the slope of the relationship between the company stock return and the market uh, index return. Uh, alpha is the slope, and we also did Jensen Alpha, if you remember, yeah? Uh, which shows the difference between what you perform and what you're expected to perform. So I will not spend too much time on this. Uh, there are some problems with uh, beta. I, I hope you remember, and if at any point of time you feel that uh, we haven't discussed this topic before or some of the contents, uh, and if you think that you need some more uh, discussion about it, just ra raise your hand. Don't let me go uh, uninterruptedly. 
Uh, if I can define beta once again, we have done many times, but I'll define once again, I, I will draw this picture. All right. I hope this picture can be captured. Uh, by the, okay. So, yeah. So if I here, if I take, uh, so I can say that the company stock return depends upon the market or the index stock return. So why is a portfolio return or the company stock return if it's a one stock? And X is the index value. So I can say that Nokia's stock return depends upon the, the return of Helsinki Stock Exchange as a whole. Can I say it? Do you know what I mean? Because Nokia is a is one of the company which whose stocks are trading in Helsinki Stock Exchange. Okay, so it, it's not other way around. It's not that the Helsinki Stock Exchange depends upon Nokia stock return, but what it's opposite that Nokia's stock return is a function of or is dependent on uh, the value or the change in the value in Helsinki Stock Exchange. And this is the line which shows this relationship. So I can say that uh, in the market stock return is this something X1 and on a given value, the, the Nokia's stock return is Y1. And if there's a change of market value, then beta is equal to Y1, Y2 divided by X1, X2. So this is beta. So beta is showing the market risk. Okay. Now beta can change, obviously. Uh, here, I, I don't know how, how well uh, worst you are with uh, geometry. To me, it seems like a 45 degree angle. Yeah. Okay. So I can see that the numerator and the denominator are almost equal. So I can assume that here beta may be one. But for example, if we have this line like this, then obviously the numerator would be larger than the denominator. So I can say that beta is more than one, okay? And if we can have some companies which are very, uh, like utilities, for example, uh, whatever happens, because see, see the food companies and the utilities. We never change our food habits or the consumption of electricity in accordance to the changing market value, do we? We have very fixed habits, fixed patterns. So generally, the company which belongs to the food sector or the utilities, these companies' stock price do not change uh, so much according to the market value. They're pretty stable. That's why they call it safe company because people will never stop eating, people will never stop consuming utilities, and likewise, okay? So therefore, I can say that all else being equal, uh, if I have to draw a curve for these, uh, uh, these old-fashioned companies, these uh, utilities or the food, <laughs> in that case, beta is likely to be less than one. It's worth experimenting, it's worth checking. Look at the beta of some utility companies in the world or in Finland, um, I'm sure it's not very high. Generally, it's less than one. Does it make sense? So this is what we studied in the last topic. Uh, okay.
But the problem with this, this is called regression beta, by the way. Okay, this is called regression beta because we use regression equation. And the equation is y is equal to alpha plus beta x. That's why we call it regression beta. But this beta has a problem. The problem is that there can be some errors. As I wrote here, there can be high standard error. The errors can be uh, of different types. The first error which comes to my mind is that here we assume that the relationship between y and x is linear. All right. Look, the stock price, the reality doesn't have to fit in the model. It's a model which has to be the best model to fit in the reality. Do you get my point? But sometimes uh, we, we have a very big assumption that the model is linear and it fits in the reality. The model can be non-linear, for example. It can be, uh, who knows, the, the reality is this. It could be possible that y is equal to alpha plus beta square root x. We don't know. We don't know. We have to check it. But when we use the conventional beta or regression beta, we automatically uh, tend to believe that the reality is linear. Can you see the line? But it can be a curve also. So that's one error. Uh, and the second error could be that we choose time period. Like, like in your assignment two or three, I guess, you will be taking how many years period? Two years or three years, I guess. Huh? Three years, okay. But it could be possible that the, the current past, the recent past, the recent past uh, is more, more important than the, uh, than, than the distant past. Do you get my point? It could be possible that a company has done something uh, two months ago, and that is what pushing the price of the company's share up and down. But if you look at the Excel, Excel treat all the values equally, even they, they, are, they belong to yesterday or 10 years ago. There's no qualitative difference between the near future, uh, sorry, the recent past and the distant past. But that could be a problem that we never distinguish between the recent past and the distant past. So it means that the time frame that we have taken to analyze it uh, is, is not, is not very uh, is not very representative. So in that case, the, the 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 error of measurement could be very high. The third problem we find is that the choice of index. Now, I can talk that in in Helsinki Stock Exchange there is a Nordic All Index, Nordic 40 index, which means only top 40 companies. And then there is also one index which comes to, which only belongs to Nordic Finland index. Do you get my point? Nordic all mean all the Nordic companies and I compare Nokia with all the Nordic companies, which includes Norway, Sweden, uh, uh, Denmark. Uh, the second option is that I only take Nordic 40 companies, which means should I compare Nokia with only top 40 companies in Nordic? The third is that should I only compare Nokia with the Finnish companies? So the Finnish index. So the problem is that if I take different index, should it be Nokia for uh, the Nordic 40? Should it be uh, Nordic all? Should it be only the energy index? Only the list of energy companies. Uh, sorry, the uh, not no Nokia is not energy. Like te telecom companies. Okay, so that way uh, the index would differ, and so would be the beta. Okay, so the benchmark uh, could differ uh, depending upon uh, the B, the beta depends upon several factors. I would say the first factor is that the nature of product or services offered by the company. Mm -hmm. uh, the companies which whose sales, revenue, uh, operations change drastically uh, from one season to another season, from one cycle to another cycle, they normally have high beta uh, in comparison to companies who's, uh, who are more stable, okay? So I would say that uh, all else being equal, 
the beta of a ice cream making company would be higher than the beta of electricity company. Do you get my point? Because for the ice cream, the, the cyclical uh, factors play a big role. Of course, people consume ice cream in the winter time, but the, the overall consumption is lesser. Uh, whereas for electricity, you can say that it's more or less stable. Of course, we use more electricity in winter, but I don't think it makes much difference because we consume electricity in, in summertime as well. Uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the winter, we use it for heating, but in the summer, we use it for cooling. So that even out, basically. Okay. Uh, the second factor is that the luxury good yeah, you know, we have three category of goods normally. Uh, we have the necessities and the absolute essentials. Then we have the comforts. And the third category is called luxuries. Uh, it's very difficult to distinguish between three. But the thing is that if those, those goods and services which are, your, which are required for your life and your dignity, um, I would call them essential. They're absolutely important. And if you have something better quality, it becomes comfort. And it becomes, if it becomes too posh, it becomes a luxury. Okay? So I would say, if I have to show uh, the beta of essentials, uh, which are necessities, the comforts, and the luxuries, I would again go back to this curve, which we have drawn already. I would say that this beta is for essentials more or less comforts, luxuries. And I have a proof for it. Uh, I have the data right now, but once I was checking the beta of a company, check by yourself, why not? The beta of an energy company was around 0 0.5. But when I saw the beta of this company called Wimpy, Wimpy is a company which makes very luxury houses, uh, for all the rich, rich football players, and they have uh, apartments and special, these, you know, very, very exquisite hotels and holiday homes in Bahamas, in, in Jamaica, in Dubai. Their beta was, that company's beta was approximately five. Five. The five is a whopping number of beta. It, be, it means that when the rest of the market grows by 1%, the company grows by 5%. But at the same time, when the rest of the market drops by 1%, this company drops by 5%. So it's an ultra, it's a hypersensitivity uh, of, the of the company stock return to the market stock return. This shows uh, the degree of responsiveness is massive. Okay? Uh, so this, this company, for example, this Vimpy, which I said, uh, would be more uh, desired by an investor who is an not only risk lover, but an extremely risk lover investor. On the contrary, if you are a risk lover investor, you would not choose a utility company because it's a, it doesn't change much. All right. Uh, and then some more factors, the growth companies normally have high beta. Uh, yeah, I gave you an example of first energy company and Taylor Wimpy. A Taylor Wimpy is this holiday home makers. Okay. Uh, okay. The growth firms have high beta and the, the, the old fashioned companies have small beta. So that's quite simple. Uh, the new concept, which I want to discuss with you is operating leverage. Operating leverage. Leverage is the, the leverage that we shall discuss in this lecture is of two types. The first one we, we do now is operating leverage. And the second uh, leverage is the financial leverage. Okay. Uh, the operating leverage essentially is the, it shows that what percentage of total cost is constituted by the fixed cost. In some companies, in some industries, in some sectors, I hope you are aware that the proportion of fixed cost is massive. If you want to start some transport company or a or this haulage company, or if you want to have some shipbuilding company or a ship shipping company, 
uh, or if you want to have an airline company, you know, uh, or airline manufacturer company, or you have the oil uh, extraction company, like, like BP or Shell, you can see that the fixed cost make a very big proportion of your total cost, the fixed assets. But on the contrary, uh, if you are an IT firm or a media firm or some, some R&D company, then you are more uh, counting on or, or how to say it, you are more uh, leveraging on your intellectual capital. Okay, so in that case, uh, such companies, they can have smaller operating leverage and the companies which are very heavily dependent on fixed cost, they can have the higher uh, operating leverage. So uh, we, we take an example here. Have a look at this case. Uh, there is a company, I take their net sales of the firm, net sales, you know, the sales revenue, basically. The same way, you can pick up one company or you can do it for more than one company. Remember this company you have chosen already. So I, I would prefer that the one or two companies which you, which you pick up, they should be the same companies who you have dealt with in your second, third, and fourth assignment. So keep the company same. Company is same, all right? Uh, what you need to do is go to the annual report of the company and in the income statement, you will see the sales of the firm, right? And then you also see the EBIT. You know EBIT? The earnings before interest and tax. The earnings before interest and tax. Is any other name for EBIT? Huh? Say it loud. Well, that is uh, that is earnings before interest and tax. But what is the more common? Huh? No. No. <laughs> it is operating profit. Operating profit. <laughs> <laughs> operating profit. Okay. Uh, do you know the concept of operating profit? The profit which arises because of the main core functions of the company. Mm -hmm. uh, so we take the data, two data basically. We have the company sales revenue, net sales revenue, um, and, or, or, and we take the EBIT, which is the operating profit. And then we find the change, the percentage of change. You can see here that 37.95 is the change of revenue in 1990 over 1989. Okay? And thus we find the percentage changes. And then we find the average change. Average means the average of all these changes. And then we have the EBIT data, the operating profit data. And then we find what percentage change occurs in EBIT, uh, Y to Y, year to year. And then we find the average of this change. So we have two averages. The average of change in net sales revenue over how many years? Because we, we can't find for the first year because we don't know the previous data. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So add these 10 values and divide by 10. It gives you the average uh, percentage change in sales revenue. And then same way, you will have 10 values of EBIT percentage change, uh, add them up, divide by 10. In Excel, you don't even have to add them first, just find the average. It gives us 34.94. And then we divide the percentage change in EBIT Divide uh, and then by the percentage change in sales. And this gives us 1.07. Okay. Any operating leverage more than one 
shows that your company's profitability is excellent. So your sales revenue is increasing, but your profit is rising faster than mm. the sales. Look, I can increase the sales of my company by giving a discount. With that, I can change, I can increase my sales revenue, maybe, but my profitability will go down because I'm, I'm giving a big discount. It's very easy to attract customers. You can give them discount, but the question is that, is it sustainable? So for a company's long-term sustainability, it's very important that they are having, uh, their, their operating leverage ratio is quite high. Yes, sir. Well, it, 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 uh, to be honest, there is no, the only yardstick is one. As long as it is more than one, it's fine. Uh, and the second yardstick could be how sustainable you can. Like, for example, then there can be some fast IT companies. They come, they conquer, and then they disappear. All right? Their, their beta could be three, four, five, but they, they, their longevity, their life is so short. On the contrary, you can have something like um, LG or GE uh, or, or Ford. Volkswagen or these kind of companies which have a legacy. Their beta may not be so high, but they are more sustainable. Huh? I think if your beta is less, uh, I think if your operating leverage is less than one for three, four, five consecutive years, you have something to be, to be worried of. It means that something is wrong with the cost structure. So your fixed costs are mounting. That's why, look, your fixed costs are increasing. That's why your EBIT is going down. So you need to, you need to reduce your fixed cost. And, and sometimes, sometime, you know what? Sometimes fall, falling operating leverage is a sign of success, a good future. The year when you buy a huge num amount of new machinery, on that year, your depreciation would be very high. On that year, your operating profit will also be falling. All right? So you will have a low operating leverage. But the question is that there is a good news in the hindsight because you're going for the growth. Okay? So this, this operating leverage figure should be taken with a pinch of salt. So I, as a financial analyst, when I see operating leverage of a company, I will not press the panic button immediately. I will go and look further. And if the company has not done much investment, they haven't done huge amount of fixed assets investment, but despite that, last five years, operating leverage is going down, down, down. I have a reason to be worried of. It means that something is definitely wrong with the, with the control system of the company, that the fixed cost is rising, even though there's no real big uh, investment project taken up by the firm. Okay? So we don't have to be judgmental immediately uh, looking at the low operating leverage coefficient, but it can give us uh, a food for thought to make a further investigation. And then you can make your judgment. Right? Okay? Uh, task four, which you are going to do as a group, calculate operating leverage based on at least five year data obtainable in the financial statements of a chosen firm. Okay, so what you need to do is you will be finding a company. I, I once again, I repeat, uh, I would be very happy that the company you pick up is the one, one of the companies which you picked up for your previous tasks because. So in the previous tasks, you are talking about the market performance of the company. You see the stock prices, but now you go to the company's financial statements. So now you see the book performance, the book value, how the company behave in the books. Okay, so I will do one task for you. Um, and then I would show you that how I would see this whole thing, yeah? Uh, so. I want to show you. Uh, 
I want to show you. So if I go to Kone, for example, uh, if I type in Kone, and will report 2018. Um, so I have the PDF. Uh, let me share the screen with you so that you know what I'm doing. Yeah. And where is the, if you can see the financial statements. Well, okay. Oh yes, I, I don't even have to go back to the, I don't even have to go deeper in the, uh, in the real statement, but see what here, I have the, I have the operating income and sales, yeah? I have only one year, uh, I have only two years, so I can only get one figure, yeah? Comparing two years, and I find that the change in sales revenue is 3.1. But when I see the operating income that is EBIT, uh, as I said, it can be operating profit or operating income, but it's same thing. Conceptually, income is not same as profit, but sometime in the accounting, accountant use it for their own convenience. And then EBIT uh, change is minus 12.6. So if I have to find the operating leverage of Kone, it will be minus 12.6. Uh, minus 12.6 divided by 3.1. So something about minus four. Uh, nothing can be worse than a negative <laughs> operating leverage, right? But it could be possible. As I said, don't be judgmental. Don't be judgmental. It could be possible that the company has done massive investments the last couple of years and because of that their their uh, you know the depreciation is is massive and that's why their profit is down mm -hmm. are you with me so be be careful that you should but but apparently when i see when i divide minus 12.6 by 3.1 uh, operating leverage is not only bad but horrible uh, because it's not only negative, but it's minus four, which means four times negative. So I can say that for every 1% increase in the sales revenue, uh, the profits are decreasing by minus 4%, yeah, by 4%. This is something to be worried of. Okay. Um, all right. We're doing well, I guess. And then I, uh, one more thing before I go, I, I just remember that in Optima, I have given you one example of leverage. So let me share screen once again with you. Uh, if you go to the Excel spreadsheets, there is a operating leverage example. It's a template. And I told you that for every task, you will see a template, yeah? And just in case I, you don't find any, let's say task, something, and there is no example done, then please bring to my notice. So here we see uh, this company is, uh, what's the title of this? Is it Marks and Spencer? No, no, it's not. I'm, I'm not sure who's, who, which company is this because I didn't write it. So the company's uh, year is 2011 to 15, net sales. And then you can see that there is a change in sales. So Excel will do things for you. So you can see the, the, the current year, uh, use brackets very carefully, yeah? So there is a change in sales revenue, and then this is the EBIT. EBIT is your operating profit. 
And then here, there is change in the operating profit. And from here, we can find the average, average percentage change in sales revenue and average percentage change in EBIT. And, huh? Sorry? Yeah? Okay. So this is, uh, and then we find uh, the average percentage change in EBIT divided by the average percentage change in sales revenue. And that would give us operating leverage 2.69. Okay, 2.69. So same way you pick up a company, take last five years, make their, find their columns. And by the way, how to get the information? I think you can, uh, 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 wait a sec. What is the name of that website where you can get the financial ratios from? I'll let you know. But otherwise, if you go to the company's annual reports, you can find the archives also, and then you can see the previous years also. Generally, uh, for each annual report, you can find three years data, like now 18, 17, 16. So then you go to 16th report, you'll find 16, 15, and 14. Likewise, uh, but I think I would be sharing with you one web page. I, I'm, I'm scanning in the back of my head uh, the name of this website, which is very common to get the financial ratios. Hmm? I'll check for you. But otherwise, if you go to the particular company's uh, investor cell section and look at their annual reports, you can find the last year's data. Go to archives, no problem. If problem, come to me. I will make it worse. Uh, that's task four, yeah? Any questions about task four? Okay. Task five is, uh, which you will be, which is based on the next type of uh, leverage. And this leverage is called financial leverage. Financial leverage is about your borrowing. Financial leverage is based on a common uh, line of thinking that when you borrow more, you invite more risk. Borrowing can be risky. Financial leverage is based on the concept that the financial leverage is based on the concept that borrowing is attractive and dangerous at the same time. Attractive. It is attractive because the, on borrowing you pay interest, right? And interest is tax deductible. We don't pay interest on tax because you pay interest first and then pay tax. On the contrary, if you have equity, well, why if you definitely have equity? On equity, you pay dividends. Dividends are calculated after you had paid tax. It means the, the burden, the X of tax man falls on equity more than the debt. So debt is attractive. Leverage is attractive. But a word of caution. If you are borrowing, then you are also putting a pressure on yourself to repay the debt and the interest on debt. And if you fail to do it, not only fail to do it, but if the third party rating agencies write some bad comments about you, they give you some bad rating, that would press the panic button in the market and the the potential danger can become the actual threat. So therefore, the operating, uh, sorry, the financial leverage, you have to be very careful of uh, when you make some interpretations. So uh, the financial leverage, uh, because you know what is beta, I will make the starting point of this topic from beta. 
the beta can be levered beta and unlevered beta. The beta uh, that you have done in task two and three and four, I guess, is based on the fact that company has borrowed money. All the companies which have chosen, I, I, I want to ask you, uh, or, or if you don't know it, check, check again. I'm sure you have made the groups and you have done the, this task already or if doing it. I'm sure you have the companies which you will be analyzing in your task. One thing you do, go back to the companies you've chosen, go back to the balance sheet and check, is there any company which has no debt at all? The amount of debt could be very high or very low, but is any company which has zero debt? All right. And the fact that the companies or most of the companies have debt, the fact that the companies do have debt also is reflected in the stock exchange. And the beta that you have calculated already is incorporating, inclusive, aware of the fact that companies have leverage or debt. Therefore, the beta that you calculate for task two, three, and four, I have no hesitation in calling that beta as levered beta because that beta is inclusive of the fact that the companies often have debt. Are you aware of what I'm saying? Did you get my point? The levered beta is basically the beta you have done. So, so the beta, how many of you have calculated beta uh, in your tasks? Have you done? Have you? Okay, or, or the beta which, or, or, or the spreadsheets which I share, shared with you, uh, Kone comprehensive calculation, or uh, I think I also calculated Nokia's beta as well. All the beta which you see in the spreadsheet folder are basically levered betas. Levered means the fact that the companies do have borrowings. But then we may be interested in knowing, hey, what if, because in finance, we, we believe a lot of in this situation called scenario analysis, scenario, or in simple words, we call it what if analysis. What if the company has no debt? Just imagine company with zero debt, how its beta would have looked like. So this is hypothetical, yeah? Hypothetical, fictitious, imaginary. Uh, you can call it potential. This beta, this non-existent beta is called unlevered beta. So you may be interested in knowing that, hey, my beta, my portfolio beta, my company beta is 1.27. Oh my gosh, it's too big, dangerous. What if the company had zero debt, how its beta would look like? And then you assume that there is no debt and recalculate your beta and the beta comes out to be 0 0.75. Oh, it's safe, 0 0.75, 1.25, there is a 0 0.50 beta systematic risk. 50% extra risk is only because of debt. Debt is risky for this company. Do you get my point? So first of all, let me tell you that the beta which you calculate or the beta you see in the headlines like, like in Yahoo Finance or Reuters or whatever website you see, that beta is levered beta. <laughs> And the other name of this beta is called equity beta. I think I wrote it somewhere here, mm -hmm. equity beta. You can call it levered beta or, un, uh, or equity beta, okay? And then sometimes you may be interested that, hey, what if there, there was no debt? Then you find this imaginary notional beta called unlevered beta. This beta assume no debt, 
okay and this is called unlevered beta or i have one more name for it asset beta asset asset beta or unlevered beta okay and the formulation is this that if you have the if you have the levered beta just divide by uh, divide by this numerator a uh, one bracket one plus one minus corporate tax rate multiply by leverage d to e ratio but use the brackets very carefully very carefully okay uh, if you don't put the brackets rightly um, it can go horribly wrong and then we can find about the uh, this beta okay um, i want to give you an example actually i think there is one spreadsheet which i which i have but before i go here uh wait a sec i can take down to, uh, oh yes there is a microsoft leave, levered and unlevered beta i want to show you this spreadsheet it's in uh, it's in the optima uh is it visible let's see it yes it is all right uh, have a look i took microsoft the famous american company in the it i took the stock price and then i uh, compare it with nasdaq index because it's a it's a tech company and then i find the the famous formula of calculating stock return you know the the current price minus previous price brackets closed divide by the previous price and then then i find the index value return the same formula so and then i find the beta which is a slope function i hope yeah and it comes out to be 1.15 mm -hmm. which shows that beta is more than 1 so it's for risky investors but this beta this beta i would call as levered beta or equity beta the fact is that microsoft borrow let's assume that microsoft had no debt how its beta would have looked like mm -hmm. and what i do here to find out uh to find out unlevered beta you need to find three things of course you have to have levered beta's value but you also need to find out the corporate tax rate the corporate tax rate and you also need to know how much the company has the debt and how much it has equity so i need to have three additional values to know and these values i can find out from the income statement and balance sheet so i have profit before tax tax and when i divide tax divide by profit before tax it gives me effective tax rate effective tax rates means how much percentage uh, what is the tax percentage this company gives look i can tell you something <laughs> i use the word effective here i didn't say tax rate i said effective tax rate if i just google corporate tax rate in the us let's say i come out with some x percentage figure that doesn't mean that every company in, in america is paying that percentage of tax what this company is actually paying that's for me that's more important and i call it effective tax rate not the headline tax rate but what is the tax which company is paying and how do you know it well you have profit before tax then tax divide tax by profit before tax like for example if a company's profit is 100 tax is 20 net profit is 80 and if i divide 20 by 100 it gives me 20 percent tax rate okay so what that's what i do and then this much is debt to the company uh, microsoft and this is equity 
and the D2E ratio is 1.19. It means that Microsoft is highly levered company. Uh, this, this is not the part of the task, but I just tell you that when I was studying my courses in finance and uh, Microsoft was a miracle company at that time, no company has ever had such limelight as Microsoft had in terms of growth. Uh, at that time, companies, I, I have no hesitation in saying that uh, Microsoft's liabilities, the debt was only two or three percentage of, but now you see it's, it's even more than equity. So, and moreover, Microsoft is no longer a growth company. <laughs> it's become like the growth phase is over now, right? Anyways, so the D2E ratio is this, and then we fit all these numbers here. And this formula, can you see it? This formula is the same as which I have here. Levered beta divided by big bracket, one plus small bracket, one minus corporate tax rate, small bracket closes, D2E ratio multiply, and the big bracket close. So keep, keep conscious of the brackets. And when I put here all these numbers, F3 is the levered beta divided by bracket one plus one minus J9. J9 is by the way, your effective corporate tax rate multiplied by uh, something 12, J12, which is your D2E ratio and the bracket closes. It comes to be 0 0.55. Now, please look at this. Have a look at this beta and this beta. It's almost 60 points. So I can say that Microsoft is almost 100% more levered, more risky because of debt. With debt beta and without debt beta. So it means that imagine Microsoft had no debt its systematic risk would have been would have been 0 0.55 almost moderate risk company and then 1.15 the actual beta is high risk company so look at the transition and among other things a major contributor is debt okay this is reality this is fiction but fiction is sometimes important because you can see that, hey, how things would have looked like. I'm not saying that Microsoft should not have taken debt, but then be, be prepared to face the music. And the music is that your systematic risk has jumped so high. Mm -hmm. So this way, uh, we also can find out uh, unlevered beta. Unlevered beta is like a introspection you are introspecting what if the company was without debt how much risk exposure it would have taken that's the rationale so it's like a it's like a, some, some sort of uh, as i said the word introspection all right Uh, mm -hmm. Why can I see it? Ooh, sorry. Um, Okay, now, now I want to give you a task which you hopefully do by yourself, or I can explain it to you. There's a company called TwoSoft. Have you heard about this firm? Mm -hmm. Alexandra, have you? Do you know this company? Mm -hmm. You know, this is one of the one of the best company in the world. Where is it? 
You can give us color. <laughs> this is a this is a hypothetical company, too soft. And it's an IT firm, it's a private firm. Maybe its office is only in one room. And this company is a private company, or it's but you know what? This company has a uh, is also suffering from the syndrome called what if syndrome. And the company thinks that what if what if I were a public company? What if I were a company as big as Adobe, Microsoft, or Oracle, or these kind of big giants in the field of technology? Or if I want to, if I choose to become a public company, how much risk I would face? You know, some companies, there are some private companies, very successful private companies, and they are in a big uh, decision in the board of directors and with the shareholders that should we become a public company or should we remain as a private company? Uh, just becoming a public company doesn't guarantee you more funding because it, it's, it's sometimes it has very strong backlash. Should we remain private or should we become public? Or if you are only a very small company, you may be interested in knowing that how much market risk I'm exposed to. Then you choose some legend companies. Does this word sound familiar, Bilal, for your project? We choose some legend companies. And this company chooses that I think if I have to benchmark myself, I would compare myself with Microsoft, Oracle, and Adobe systems, which are established companies. And here, you find that their equity beta is 0 0.75, 1, 1 1.08, and debt and equity figures. I hope you know what is beta equity. Beta equity is levered beta. It means this, this beta is levered beta, okay? So you want to know, hey, what if I become a listed company? How much would be my levered beta? And, and then you go further. How much it will be my unlevered beta if I become a public company with zero debt? So you're asking yourself two questions. For the first question, and let, let's say uh, the risk-free rate is 4% in the market, which is too high, and the risk premium uh, is 8.4, and the corporate tax rate is 34%, and CAPM holds, you know CAPM? CAPM is your capital assets, asset pricing model. Risk-free rate is 4%, you know, RF, risk-free rate. Risk premium, you know what is risk premium? So for example, uh, Do you see this model familiar to you? Have you seen this? Have you seen it before? Sorry? Return on investment of some company A. Uh, let's call it some, let's call it Microsoft. Is equal to risk-free rate in the USA plus beta of Microsoft. And then there is bracket RM, which means a return on the whole market. Let's say return on NASDAQ um, minus risk-free rate in the US. Have you seen it? I think you have. Remember Jensen Alpha? Remember Kone Comprehensive Calculation Spreadsheet? You see there. This is the way we calculate the minimum required rate of return the theoretical rate of return. And this is determined by which model? Capital asset pricing model, which was developed by Harry Markovich. He, he, he got Nobel Prize. 
and then it was developed uh, further developed by uh, a trainer and some, some more people and I, and i told you that this model has won three nobel prizes in economics so far hmm? and the model is so simple isn't it so it's not very difficult to win nobel prize in economics finance is basically part of economics so, so the, many nobel prizes have gone to uh finance but they are called in economics and remember we was it last year or previous year it was uh, it was uh behavioral yeah behavioral finance and what was the name of the scholar who won homstrom uh homstrom he 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 has finished roots and he developed this uh, agency model so yeah uh, anyway coming back to it this component is called risk premium the difference between rm the market portfolio and minus risk free rate is called market risk premium okay and how much is this it's 8.4% the tax rate is 34% here the risk free rate is uh, 4% so basically you have everything uh and the capm holds and you know the in the previous slide i showed you that the legend companies are microsoft oracle and adobe and th these numbers are just fictitious okay so don't don't worry too much uh yeah so we have debt equity okay go back to so So then what we do here we start calculating unlevered betas of these companies so we calculate unlevered beta for microsoft for oracle for adobe and then we find the average and this beta is the unlevered average of true soft true soft this company which we are talking about this fictitious company <laughs> and then based on this and can you find out the average of levered beta well it's 1.08 plus 1 plus 0.75 divided by 3 so average of these three numbers would be a uh, levered beta of true soft but because we are able to convert the levered beta into unlevered beta of each of them then we can also find the average unlevered beta for too soft and then we use capm and we apply these calculations can you see here the two calculations this is comparable to this 0.84 risk premium is comparable to this the only thing differs is here it's 0.94 and here it's 0.83 0.94 is the average of levered beta 0.83 is the average of unlevered beta and when you apply it comes to be 10.97 when you apply this it comes to be 11.89% it means that it means what it means that if two soft company wants to invite public to invest in its shares and it want to go with debt with debt as well the minimum return it must give to its investors is 11.89% so in the hurdle race the hurdle the bar the hurdle rate is 11.89% with debt if too soft also wants to be a borrower but if too soft wants to go with no debt but 100% finance by equity then bar would be slightly lower to 10.97% it means that investors attach more risk premium if a company is borrowing so borrowing adds to 
the borrowing cost and hence the capital cost of equity, uh, cost of capital so if you want to invite people to invest in your company with debt be prepared to give them 11.89% but if you want to go without debt then you pay them 10.97% the minimum the minimum so thus you can calculate your first of all look at this case first of all this company is imaginary it's a private company and then this private company is thinking hey well, what would be my systematic risk and then you find their you just like the legend companies comparable companies and then you find the beta and then you say how much i would be risk exposed if i have no debt then you can find your average unlevered beta average unlevered beta and then you go further and you say that if i have to raise capital from uh, the stock market okay uh, how much i pay how much minimum i pay not pay how much minimum i pay to my would be investors if i also borrow all right 11.89% and what if i only uh, if what if i don't borrow at all and i have only share capital equity share capital well 10.97% you have an answer to almost every hypothetical question okay um, this is called so task 5 is you need to calculate levered and unlevered beta of your company and take the company which you have done before and then task 6 would be that you again just like this company in question which we had this imaginary company too soft uh, you imagine that you are a newborn company or you are not a newborn company but you want to become public then what would be your levered and unlevered cost of capital so 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 far uh, when you when you complete this task you we will be done with six tasks basically so we left with four more okay so i would suggest you that for the rest of the time uh, if you know your team members huddle together sit together and or otherwise there's no harm in taking some numbers from some website and start playing with task 5 and 6 in front of me so that if you have a question you can ask me for help